Welcome to the Decision Masters Podcast. I'm your host, Kirsten Parker. I'm a coach who specializes in conscious, clear-headed decision-making, which, despite how hard we work and how smart we are, is not always easy. Each week, I'll bring you science-backed tools and strategies to use in your daily life and career to make more confident, authentic decisions. Oh, and we're going to make it easy while we're at it. If you're into a life with less overthinking, people-pleasing, and perfectioning, and more making what you want matter, you're in the right place. So happy you're here. Let's get into it. Hello, I cannot wait to talk to you today about the problems you really need to solve to get out of the habit of feeling behind. This is a two-parter, and it's a part of our series that we're doing on this whole behind phenomena that we are getting out of for 2024 and beyond, and I am so jazzed. In the last episode, if you haven't heard it yet, we talked about ditching the mindset of I'm behind and really prioritizing getting on board with the idea that I don't want to think this and feel this way anymore before we go into problem solving mode. Typically what we do to respond to feeling behind is feel terrible and then try to catch up. And if I just ask people to look at the evidence, if you haven't had success with that, if that hasn't worked to get you caught up, and get you staying caught up, then let's try something different. So today we're going to start talking about the problems we really need to solve. If what we need to really solve is not just catching up this one time on this one thing, because that doesn't solve the problem of living in this cycle, what are the problems we do need to solve? And I just want to hit you with a quick semantic thought before we get into the details. You know me, you know I love semantic. And if you are struggling with this idea of letting go of this I'm behind language. I get it. It's very, very easy to feel like it's factual. I'm behind. And here's what I suggest. Here's how you can make changing all of these habits easier. Just start being more specific. Okay, you're not behind where you should be because where you should be is not an objective fact. It's stuff made up that we're going to talk about today. Where you are behind, if we have to use that language, is where you thought you would be or where you wanted to be. All right. So as you move forward and you're digesting these podcast episodes and you're getting on board with this idea, like I don't want to live my entire rest of my life feeling behind, but it's an ingrained habit. So it's hard to just switch off like a light switch. Start using this different language. Just make this tiny, subtle shift. Stop saying I'm behind and start being more specific. I'm behind where I thought I would be. I'm behind where I wanted to be. I don't want you to feel behind for the rest of forever. And that's what we're going to talk about the specific problems to solve. But even just making this this super subtle shift can help neutralize the idea of where you are. Makes a big difference. Okay, so let's talk solutions. When we say we're behind, and we mean I'm behind where I thought I would be or wanted to be, what's really happening is we're not getting the things done in the way we want them to get done in the time we want them to get done, right? And a lot of factors can be at play here. So I want to help you simplify things so that this feels like a solvable, manageable problem. And the simplest way to think about it is if I want to create different results, then I either have to change what I'm thinking, change what I'm doing, or both. And that is how we're going to break it down. This episode today is about the thinking. Let's look at how you're thinking about your productivity, your schedule, your time, and see if there's anything we need to change in order to create different results. Remember, like we said last week, we can't buy into the assumption that if you feel behind, that you are behind. And you absolutely need to do more and become different. So let's look today at what are you thinking and what adjustments might be needed in order to experience different results. In next week's episode, we're going to talk about the doing. What do I need to do differently to create different results? Oh, and I just, I don't know if you can tell, but I am so excited to get into this. All right. Before we go any further, I need to remind you that the calendar clinic is tomorrow. So if you're listening to this live, January 11th, then you still have time to sign up. We're doing this on Friday, January 12th 
2024. You can sign up for free at kirstenparker.com forward slash calendar clinics. And if you're listening to this after the 12th, then still go to that website. The link is in the show notes and you can get the replay immediately. We are getting our calendars in order for 2024. So there are three main questions I'm going to ask you to consider as we look at, is there anything you need to change in your thinking in order to create different results? The first question is, are you clear on where your time should be going? Should is in air quotes, according to you, because you are the maker of all of the rules about your time, okay? But you're never going to feel like you're doing enough if enough is never defined. You're never going to be able to fully believe today was a good day if you haven't decided in advance what makes a good day. And too often, old rules and old standards and other people's opinions creep in to the way that we judge our productivity and what happens in a day. And we end up feeling like, huh, not enough. Didn't do a good job today. If you're used to giving yourself just a B minus because, I don't know, if you didn't end up on the floor exhausted, you probably didn't work hard enough today, then that's what you're going to give yourself. B minus, B minus, B minus. Even if you put in a 16-hour day, even if you do one hour of the most stellar work of your entire career. So we have to interrupt that pattern. We have to start defining your time and defining enough so that you know when am I working, when am I not working, where am I supposed to be, according to me, the rule maker, so that by the end of the day, you can know if you did a good job or not following your own rules, especially if you work from home, if you work for yourself or if you are at all digitally connected to your job, our brains can fall into the trap of thinking we should be working all the time because we can be, technically. So I really want you to think about, do I know when my on time is? When my off time is? When is my family time? When is my personal time? Have you clearly defined these expectations so that when it is 7 p.m. at night and you're not working, you don't feel like you're doing something wrong. If you did all of the work that you planned on doing that day and you get to the end of the day, do you think, yeah, I did a good job. I did enough today. Or are you automatically judging whatever has happened, even if it was following the exact plan, as not enough? So what to do with this question number one? Are you clear on where your hours want to be going is define enough, define your hours. What's work time? What's me time? What's sleep time? And you might have to do this on a daily basis if your schedule is up and down, if it's always changing. You might have days where you are going to work six hours and you might have days where you're going to work 10 hours. If you're deciding in advance, yeah, I'm going to do six hours of work today. If you're deciding in advance, yeah, I'm going to do two hours of work today and that's enough, then that's essentially you having a conversation with your future self. Your future self at the end of the day, who is going to look back and want to judge everything and give it a grade. And future you, when you get to that point in the timeline, is going to look back and say, hmm, we did two hours of work. Yep, that's exactly what we said we had to do. Good job. A plus. The next question I want you to consider is kind of a doozy, but you can handle it. And it's such a good one. Are you setting kind and honest self expectations? So most of us think in terms of realistic expectations. We want to be realistic about the expectations that we set for ourselves. But this rarely works. Why? We hold ourselves to such banana standards that we think it should be realistic to put a three-hour block of work time on our calendar and then just do that and never need a break and never get distracted. It should be realistic that we can go from this meeting to that meeting to this meeting to doing emails perfectly and then finishing completely and then going to that meeting and not need any buffer time or in-between moment to process. If you don't have a good definition of realistic, then realistic expectations are not going to serve you. That was in air quotes. So what to do here is see what happens when you start setting honest self-expectations and kind self-expectations. We're going to define honest expectations as realistic minus perfectionism. Okay, that's all it is. 
Are you honestly going to get all of your emails done in that 30 minute block? Or do you do that every week and it never gets done in that time? And it's just something you decided should happen, should be realistic, but it always screws up your day because you never finish and it messes up everything else and you feel behind. Honest expectations can be tricky because they feel like a confrontation with our humanness. And so many of us think of our humanness as a failure. We just think we're never doing enough and we're not good enough yet. So it's okay if you need to take a deep breath and muscle your way through this a little bit to find honest expectations. But I also want you to be honest about how terrible it feels to put 27 things on your to-do list, 23 of which were from yesterday, only get four of them done, and then know that you're going to drag the leftovers into tomorrow and just go on and on and on in that cycle. If we're being honest, that feels terrible. So can we start being more honest that, yeah, these are the four things that are going to get done today? Or if I'm only giving myself 30 minutes for emails, this is my honest expectation of how many emails get done. Or honestly, I'm going to need an hour and a half for emails. If it feels icky at the beginning, I promise you're not alone, but I cannot tell you how many clients I have worked with on this very habit who end up telling me weeks and months later how nice it is to effortlessly put together their to-do list for the day. They know that it's doable and they're not disappointed with themselves for not doing more because they are in full acceptance of like, what's going to happen today, honestly. So we also want to make sure you're setting kind self-expectations, and those are expectations that account for your health and happiness. We all know we can go seven hours working without taking a break or consuming food because we've done it. It works-ish. It's not kind. We all know that we can promise that thing tomorrow because we'll just work through lunch, or we'll stay up later, or we'll move that thing that we were going to give ourselves. It works ish, but it's not kind. When you're constantly squeezing more and more in, when you're never asking for help, when you're never tempering your promises, when you're always expecting 110% from yourself, there's no room for error. There's no room for surprises. There's never room to catch your breath. You're setting yourself up to feel behind. So what to do here is just take a look at your schedule and ask, is it honest and is it kind? The third and final question we are going to investigate is who else is in your head? Where are your expectations coming from? Where does your schedule structure come from? Is there a guru in your head who says you should definitely time block? Or is there a different guru in your head who says you should definitely not time block? Point A of this exploration of who's in your head is that there is no one size fits all for time management. I did a quick little research project which means I opened a tab in Google. I went to Amazon, I went to books, I went to self-help, and I went to time management. It's its own specific category. And you know how many options you have? Just in this one marketplace, over 50,000. If over 50,000 books have been written on personal time management, then I think it's fair to conclude that there's not an easy obvious single solution that should just work for everyone. All right. So if you're grappling with a bunch of gurus in your head and a bunch of, but I read a book and it said, this is the best way, or I talked to an expert and they said, this is the best way. The best way to disconnect from that nonsense and that stress and pressure is to trust that you are your own highest authority. You know you best. There's nothing wrong with experimenting with best practices, but I see a lot of people struggling to try to make systems and methods work because someone else said they should work and they just don't work for them. So here's my advice on this. First, I want you to ask, honestly, what works? What works well about how you schedule things and how your calendar runs right now? Where don't you feel behind and why? We want to make sure that we note what is working well so that you don't throw it out with the baby in the bathwater thing. We don't want to change what's working for no good reason. So pay attention to what does work that I don't need to change. 
And this is going to help you get specific with the next question, which is what isn't working? If you're specific about why don't I feel on top of things? Why do I end up feeling behind? What happens specifically to create that result? Then you can give yourself specific solutions to experiment with. And I promise you'll have more success if you treat it like an experiment, not like a way you need to be instantly overnight forever and perfectly. Okay. Give yourself at least two hopefully three or four weeks to experiment with whatever solution you're going to try because it's going to feel weird at the beginning. So the first week might just be like a mushy wash of, I don't know what I'm doing and what feels good and what isn't working and what it's fine. Leave room for squishiness in your experiment. Give yourself a long enough time to collect a useful data set. And then if something doesn't work well, if you just can't get the time blocking down or the bullet journaling or the thing that you're trying isn't working for you, maybe we just don't make it a you problem. Maybe that's not something fundamentally wrong with you that you can't get this right. And it's just one of the 50,000 options that isn't a perfect fit for you. And then move on to the next experiment. When we're looking for who is in your head, we also want to scan for where your expectations coming from, who is deciding what's doable in a day, where are you getting these ideas that you're not doing enough? Do you have your boss in your head? Do you have your mom in your head? Do you have your friend of me on Instagram who you secretly follow just so you can compare yourself to them? Do you have the vision of yourself 15 years ago in your head telling you you should be doing a lot more? So this is important to pay attention to, especially if we're adopting this mindset that I am my own highest authority. I talk to so many people who are struggling with a workload that was bestowed upon them by somebody else. Somebody else decided you should be able to do this much work in this much time because this is the time that we're paying you for. And they just accept that. And when they can't do it, they make it a them problem. I want to tell you a story about my friend who works at a big um, international media company, and she runs a department of 25 people, and she is very good at her job. She came in recently, I think a year, maybe a year and a half ago, and she has delivered consistent growth of eight to 10% every quarter, which is phenomenal. You don't need to know the specifics. You just need to know that's a big half deal. Okay. When her higher up sat her down and gave her her quota for Q1 of this year, guess what it was? 25% growth, more than double what she had been doing for the past year. Now she could have responded to this in a lot of different ways. She could have gone into panic mode and started thinking, how am I going to do this? I don't have enough hours in the day. I'm going to have to work more than twice as hard. She could have freaked out and worried about instantly failing because how is she going to do this impossible amount of work? But that's not what she did because she was assessing those expectations from a place of authority. She knows what she's capable of. She knows what her team's capable of. And she knows the boundaries that they are all signing up to follow. So for her, this was actually once she got over the initial flabbergastedness of how insane this was which was annoying. But once she got over that and got through that, it was kind of neutral. It was a little bit of a no brainer. She got to go in and talk to them from a place of authority about how this was not going to happen in the way they wanted. They were not going to produce over double the results in the same amount of time with the same amount of people and the same pace of work. That just wasn't going to happen. So she got to ask them from a place of authority What are we going to change if you want the results to be different? If you're in a position where your workload feels impossible, I want to propose the idea that it might not be a you problem. It's way too easy to blame ourselves for underperforming when external expectations are set by authority figures because we think we should be able to do whatever tasks we are given. And we have stretched ourselves pretty freaking thin in the past. So we have all these reference points that get lit up in our brains when we're given an impossible task because we're like, yeah, we could find a way to do that. 
Let's roll up our sleeves. But we're not 22 anymore. And we don't want to do that, do we? And I think even if you are 22 and listening to this podcast, God bless you, first of all. And second, I think that maybe the standards are raising for younger generations than they were than, than we had 20 years ago. So I want to offer this perspective check. Who else is in your head? Where are your expectations coming from? And if your expectations are coming from people around you, people you're comparing yourself to, your boss, your department head, your industry, whatever, then let's just make sure that you're not immediately assuming you're the failure in this equation. You're the wrong one. It could be that your boss has unrealistic expectations and just wants you to work for free until you burn out. I've heard it happen. It wouldn't be the first time. There's a possibility that you might not be well-suited to this work or to this culture. If the work can't be done by you in the allotted time at the desired pace, or if the culture is, yeah, we just have to deal with being miserable. Maybe that's not your jam. Maybe that work or that work culture isn't a fit for you. And maybe your boss doesn't know. Maybe you're such a top performer and want to do such a good job that you've never made it known that you have an unreasonable workload. So let's adjust the expectations and adjust the way the calendar and schedule is set up based on you being the authority of what you're capable of, what you want to do within the boundaries that you want to honor. And if that is out of alignment with anyone else's expectations, your boss, your mom, your frenemy on Instagram, the made up people in your head, if that's out of alignment with their idea of what your day should look like, do we care? How much do we care? How much do we want to care? It's your life at the end of the day. And there might be some things that we want to change our mind about so that we like our schedules more and we like how we're using our time a little better. All right, I'm going to step down from my soapbox. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I feel like I got a little impassioned there, but this is something I care a lot about. That's why we are starting off the year with this series of how can you stop feeling like you're not doing enough. And I promise we are going to get to the logistics. I know that you can't wait. And you know me, I love me some logistics. I love a color-coded spreadsheet. We're going to get to it. Next week's episode is about what do I need to do differently in order to not feel behind, feel on top of things. I got you. But until then, please let these ideas sink in that we've talked about today. What might you have to think differently in order to feel more on top of things and stop feeling so behind. I'm going to recap for you. Are you clear on what your time is for? Are you clear on your work hours? Are you clear on your downtime? Have you decided what enough is? Have you defined what a good day is? Please start. Are you setting honest expectations? Are you setting kind expectations? And who else is in your head? And if you haven't already, please sign up for the calendar clinic. It is tomorrow if you're listening when this comes out. So it's January 12th, 2024. And if you missed it, I'm so sorry, but you can get the replay and it's still going to be super dupes valuable. Go to kirstenparker.com forward slash calendar invite. The link is in the show notes. And of course, if you want long-term help with calendar management and getting your mindset in a place of authority and ease and clarity, you can still get into the Decision Masters program. It starts January 23rd. Book your consult at kirstenparker.com forward slash schedule. We'll talk all about how the program can work for you and if it's the right next step. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Hey, want to find out your decision style? Um, obviously go take the decision style quiz. It's in the show notes and at kirstenparker.com forward slash quiz. We all have our style when it comes to making decisions, but do you know how to use your default way of thinking to your advantage? Or do you mainly get stuck in the most annoying parts of overthinking and people pleasing? The decision style quiz has your answers, my friend. Take it right now at kirstenparker.com forward slash quiz.